so. Some people are more at risk from fire than others. But who are the most vulnerable people? Research has shown that the most vulnerable people may be over 60 years of age, the risk increasing for those over 75. They may live alone, may have reduced mobility or some kind of cognitive impairment, or they may have a hearing loss. They may be someone that has a mental health illness, including dementia or memory loss, or someone with a learning disability. They may be someone who has drug or alcohol issues, or is a smoker. And of course, for anybody that has a combination of these factors, the risk from fire increases. Not only are people who are vulnerable less likely to safely escape a fire, they're also more likely to accidentally start a fire. In this programme, we will show you how to keep vulnerable people safe from fire. We have a series of practical steps and suggestions for care workers and carers that can literally save lives. But we begin with an account of how simple fire precautions could have made a massive difference. Katie was a lovely person. She had dementia and needed help with basic things, but she was always smiling. She was the person I looked after who always smiled. Katie could talk about things that happened years ago, but she couldn't always remember the last 10 minutes. Sometimes I'd make her tea, bring it into the lounge, and she'd forget who I was and why I was in her house, but she never panicked or got upset, which can happen. I just took the time to remind her and she was happy. I know that living in her own home was important for Katie. She was surrounded by the things she knew and her memories. During my time with her, I'd make sure she had her meals, had food in the fridge, that sort of thing. I would do her washing up, I'd take the rubbish out and I'd check things for her. I'd check she'd taken her medication and I'd check her smoke alarm. The thing is, Katie needed reminding of the most basic of tasks. I told her if ever the smoke alarm goes off just to leave the house straight away. Reminding, you have to keep reminding. They say the fire started in her kitchen. Often people that have dementia forget about the dangers of cookers and leave pans on the heat. They think this is what Katie did and her cooker caught a light. What happened next is guesswork. The smoke alarm went off, the neighbours heard it. Perhaps Katie forgot what the siren sound meant. She was found in the kitchen. They think when she saw the fire, she tried to tackle it. Overcome by smoke, she collapsed. So, what could have been done differently? How might Katie have survived? Anna is clearly a caring and diligent care worker. Aside from reminding Katie about the smoke alarm and what to do when it went off, is there anything else she could have done? What do you think? The fire investigation officer in this case is Bryn Strudwick, and he joins us now from the scene of the fire. Um, Bryn, when were the fire service first involved? Well, the fire service were called to the address by a neighbour who had heard the smoke alarm. By the time we arrived, the kitchen was completely involved in fire and we've had to put it out with uh, two hose reels. Unfortunately, we've also found the body of the occupier in the house. What caused the fire? Upon the investigation, we found that the fire was caused by something cooking that's been left on the cooker and that has caught fire. It would appear that although there were smoke alarms in the house and there was also a community alarm or a telecare alarm, which is linked to a 24-hour monitoring centre, the smoke alarms were not connected to that telecare system. The smoke alarms were in working order, but the occupier, who we believe was in the lounge before the fire was discovered in the kitchen, has attempted to put out the fire instead of leaving the property. Is that normal for people to try and put the fire out themselves rather than leave the house and dial 999? Uh, normally people follow the fire service advice of get out, stay out and get the fire service out. But we are finding more and more that people with dementia, as this lady had, will act in a different way. They may not understand what the smoke alarm sounding means. 
They may have forgotten the escape advice given to them. People who have an illness such as dementia rarely dial 999 or ask for help, and they will attempt to put out the fire themselves. And what can be done to protect them from the fire in the home? The fire service recommend that, uh, that the minimum level of protection for somebody that has dementia has a smoke alarm on each floor of the property and that that is linked to a telecare alarm system. When the smoke alarm is activated, the telecare alarm automatically alerts the monitoring centre who raises the alarm with the fire service. The fire service will then attend the property as quickly as possible and if required we can rescue the person before they die. In some cases a higher level of protection may be required, uh, for example such as a fixed sprinkler system that will tackle the fire before the arrival of the fire service. And what if care workers don't feel confident about the level of protection in someone's home? We just need them to fill out a referral form and send it to the local fire service and they'll do a free fire safety check. These forms can be found on fire service or local authority websites and if there's any doubt at all, contact the local fire service directly. Bryn, thank you very much. Fire services throughout the country are always happy to give practical and helpful advice that can greatly increase fire safety for everyone. To think some simple free equipment could have made such a difference. I just wish I knew then what I know now. There are some very simple things anyone can do to help prevent tragedies occurring. Things that can be done by a care worker, a friend, a neighbour or a relative to help a vulnerable person. For example, prevent electrical fires by avoiding overloading individual sockets in this manner, or indeed by plugging in, say, two heaters and one kettle into one socket, with that happening as a result. Position heaters at least one metre away from clothes and furnishings. Place portable heaters against a wall. Use a fire guard with open fires and ensure chimneys are swept at least once a year. In the kitchen, where 60% of fires start, look for evidence of burnt food, burnt pots and pans, a build-up of food and fat or combustible material on and around the cooker or the alarm going off when cooking. Advise people that cooking should never be left unattended. Chip pans should never be more than a third full of oil and never to pour water on a pan fire. Instead, they should close the door, get out and call 999. If you see evidence of dropped smoking materials on bedding, carpets, clothes or furniture, advise the use of safety ashtrays. These ashtrays must be checked before going to bed. Fire retardant bedding and throws are available from your local fire service and, in many cases, these are free of charge. If you believe you are caring for a vulnerable person at risk from fire, based on the combination of high-risk factors mentioned at the start of this DVD, the critical action is to make a referral to the fire service. These referrals go to either the fire service or the local council, illustrating how several agencies working together is key to successful fire prevention. The leaflet provided with this DVD will list all the agencies in your area that can help keep vulnerable people safe from fire. In some cases, a vulnerable person's primary carer may well be a relative. They aren't able to access the same sort of training that care workers receive and therefore may be in need of help with regard to fire prevention. This was the case with the following account. Dad's arthritis was so painful. I mean, if you were to touch his arm or something, you know, the pain would shoot straight through him. The only thing that got him through the day were the painkillers and he needed more of those at night. Dad was tough, you know, he'd, he'd been in the army, he'd, he'd worked as a drayman delivering beer to pubs and I suppose he was what you would call a man's man, you know, he, uh, he liked to have a bet, he liked to have a cigarette with his friends, he liked to laugh on a night out. Um, then after, after mum died, it just felt like he'd just gotten worse. Um, he'd been deaf for a few years and he couldn't hide that, but 
after mum died, it just felt like the arthritis got a lot worse, you know, um, like he'd finally admitted it to himself. He all but became housebound and one of the few pleasures he had was a cigarette. So I didn't tell him to give up. I, I just felt like I couldn't do that. I mean, I, I thought he was safe, you know. I mean, I, I, I kept his home tidy. I, I made sure he had smoke alarms and he'd never had an incident with his smoking at all. And the night he died, I prepared his medication. He, um, he'd wanted to stay up to watch the football. Um, so when I left him, he was absolutely fine. He was sitting on the sofa. He'd... He'd taken his medication and um, he was just waiting up for match of the day to start. And that was, that was the last time that I saw him. Lauren's father died in the house fire that night. Could this have been prevented? And if so, how? To piece together the sequence of events, I spoke to Fire Investigation Officer, Karen Pointer. Karen, can you tell us how the fire started? Yeah, the fire was started by smoking materials, more likely caused by an ashtray being knocked off of the armchair in the living room. Uh, and was there no smoke alarm on the premises? There was smoke alarms fitted on the premises, but it was actually a passerby who discovered the fire, contacted the fire service, told us that he could see flames coming from the lounge window. And if there was a smoke alarm, why didn't the person get out? Speaking to the gentleman's daughter, she informed me that the gentleman was very hard of hearing. He was also taking heavy sleeping medication, so when the alarms actuated, he was never going to hear them. So, a sad accident then? It is a very sad accident. If you look at this particular case with the protection uh, equipment that was available to this individual, standard smoke alarms just wasn't enough for him. So what else would he have needed then? For the gentleman who was hard of hearing, we could have used pressure pad pillows which vibrate and they would have been, would have notified him that the fire alarm was going off. We also have strobe lights connected to the fire alarms who could have been seen through that way. Uh, in relation to his medication, we have flame retardant bedding that could have been used. Uh, we also have fire retardant throws, furniture throws, which would reduce the risk of the cigarette starting the fire in the first place. And what about a telecare system? Telecare alarm would have been very good for this individual uh, because of the sleeping med or the medication that he was on. And that would have called the fire service straight away. It would have been linked up. We could also have used the misting system in this gentleman's bedroom. And what that would have done was that would have dampened down the fire before the arrival, initial arrival of the fire service. And telecare would allow the fire service to be called? Yes, it would, but only if it was linked to the smoke alarm. That would then go through to the call centre, who would then contact the fire service. All you seem to be saying is that different people have different needs in terms of fire safety. Yes, they do. For each vulnerable adult, we would look at them on a case-by-case -case basis, look at the risk assessment that would be required uh, to protect them from fire. Karen, thank you very much. Thank you. So, Bryn, if you're protecting a vulnerable person from fire, what can you do? OK, seek advice from a specialist fire officer. They'll carry out a uh, personal fire assessment and then offer advice on additional equipment the person needs to keep them safe in their home. Uh, what sort of additional equipment? Right, first of all, we've got um, a telecare alarm system. So that, that's the alarm part of it. And that connects to the phone line of the property and has the ability to send a signal back to a 24-hour monitoring station. People recognise that normally connected to a pendant that the person wears around their neck or on their wrist and if they fall over for instance they would push that and that would send a signal back to the unit. Okay? So really importantly for that system is that we have a specialist smoke alarm on each floor of the property connected to that so that automatically calls the call centre without the person's intervention. The call centre then calls the fire service and mobilises the fire service to the property. And what other equipment is available? If the person's hard of hearing, then we can uh, connect uh, vibrating pads and strobe lights to a smoke alarm. And that can also be connected to the telecare alarm system as well. For people that smoke, if they smoke in bed, 
then really essential is fire retardant bedding and also we do fire retardant furniture throws. Okay, and anything else? Uh, yeah, we've got cooker shut-off systems. So if the person's going to leave their cooker um, cooking on, then after so many minutes that will shut the system down and make it safe. We've also got um, a sticker system that uh, allows the identification of the adult at risk's bedroom. If there is a fire, then fire officers can go straight to that room. And what about sprinkler and misting systems? There's both portable and fixed misting and sprinkler systems that can be used uh, and they're really important in the high risk cases because they actually detect the fire quickly and then start to tackle the fire before the fire service arrive. Okay and if there was one key point you'd like to get across to people who care for vulnerable people uh, what would that be? Contact the fire service. Uh, if all the um, care workers, carers, relatives of people at risk in, in that risk category uh, make a referral to the fire service and we can work together to make the uh, person safer. Brent, thank you very much. Thank you. There's a leaflet with this DVD that outlines all relevant local phone numbers and contact details. The leaflet contains information on many services that are free of charge. Most people don't realise that they are at greater risk from fire in their own home. Those especially at risk are people who may have one or several of the following characteristics. Over 60 years of age, living alone, mobility or hearing loss issues, mental health issues including dementia or memory loss, and people who have alcohol and drug issues. Smokers are at risk, as are those who have a learning disability. There are many ways to keep vulnerable people safe from fire. As Bryn has just outlined, these include a monitored alarm system connected to a call centre such as telecare, which ensures the fire service is alerted. Such alarms can also be linked with things like vibrating pads or strobe lights for the hard of hearing. Other equipment available includes fire retardant bedding, furniture throws and nightwear, fire retardant sprays for furniture, safety ashtrays, cooker guards, portable misting or sprinkler systems, fitted domestic misting or sprinkler systems and 24-hour care. Many lives are saved each year using telecare and other equipment mentioned in this DVD. So please, act now. If you look after someone who could be at risk from fire, contact your local fire service. In doing so, you could well be saving someone's life. Thank you.